Now, there are a lot of PC building videos on YouTube, but before you click off, I wanted to explain to you why building a PC is beneficial and just how to do it. I really wanted to make a different type of video for people that may not be super familiar with why or how to build a PC, or people that may be looking to build one for the first time. I just recently completed my third PC build, so I am by far no expert, but I have a comfortable knowledge of the process. In case you hate my voice, you can find timestamps in the description below to only listen to the parts you need to. First off, why would anyone in their right mind build a PC when you can go to Walmart and buy one? Generally, you can get higher performance per dollar spent when building a PC than you would buying a pre-built PC from a store. It is therefore more economic economical to build your own desktop PC when compared to the same performance of a retail desktop computer. Additionally, building a PC versus buying one gives you a greater degree of freedom. You get to choose every single part, so whether you want your PC to be more oriented to gaming or streaming or even video editing, you can customize not only the internal parts towards your purpose, but also all of the aesthetics. You can make the parts glow, flash, and pretty much any other aesthetic choice you can think of. If you are interested in more PC building focused YouTube channels, I highly suggest checking out Linus Tech Tips and Bitwit, who make great content regarding all things computer hardware. And for many, after building their first PC, it becomes a hobby. As with any other hobby, you want to do it more and more, and eventually you end up with closets of computer parts. Now that we understand the reasons why people build their own PCs, it is important to lay out the parts of what makes a computer well, a computer. If you want to look into the resources I used, you can find them in the description below. One of the first things you'll need is a computer case sometimes called a chassis. Now, there are generally four-ish types of computer cases to consider. A full tower, a mid tower, a micro ATX, and a mini ITX, with the full tower being the largest and the mini ITX being the smallest. Most often, the case size depends on your motherboard size. ATX, which is the most common motherboard size, and could be touted as the regular motherboard size, fits within a full tower and a mid tower case. Micro ATX cases, as the name implies, fits the slightly smaller micro ATX motherboard, and the mini ITX case fits the even smaller mini ITX motherboard. For my build, I went with the Corsair Crystal 280X micro ATX case because I wanted a more form factor build so that it wouldn't take up too much space but still look pretty. I mean, look at all that. Look at all that tempered glass. How can you not want it? There are many different case styles out there, so whatever your taste, there's more than likely a case out there for you. I also saved the sweet, sweet peeling of the plastic wrap off the glass specifically for you, so enjoy this ASMR. Now that you have a good idea of the exterior of your computer, what needs to go in? Now you could put loads of spaghetti, but I suggest the following parts. A motherboard, a central processing unit, AKA a CPU, random access memory, also known as RAM, a CPU cooler, a graphics card, a power supply, and some sort of storage device. We would go through each of these parts one by one. First, the motherboard. A motherboard is basically the central hub of all the parts in the computer. It essentially allows all of the other parts to communicate and interact. Think of it like town hall of a small city. It houses the infrastructure and ability to allow all the other parts of the city to talk to each other effectively. There are tons of different motherboard manufacturers and many different technical features that each one provides. For my build, I went with the B450 Aurorus M Micro ATX motherboard from Gigabyte, which features a lot of fun technical stuff I won't get into here and some stuff I don't even understand, but elements like high quality audio capacitors, surge land protection, and anti-sulfur resistors. As I mentioned before, there are generally three sizes of popular motherboards, ATX, micro ATX, and mini ITX, with the distinguishing factor between them mostly being size and therefore features. A smaller motherboard will have less expansion slots for things like video cards and Wi-Fi cards compared to a larger motherboard with more real estate. Another distinguishing feature between motherboards is what CPU slot they support. But the main thing you have to remember regarding motherboards is there are two main CPU manufacturers, Intel and AMD. <laughs> Oh! 
Motherboard manufacturers will often produce both Intel motherboards that support Intel CPUs and AMD motherboards that support AMD CPUs. But you should know that an AMD CPU will not work nope. with an Intel motherboard. For my build, I opted for an AMD CPU. Therefore, my Gigabyte B450 Aurora's M motherboard supports AMD processors. Now that we have a brief understanding of what a motherboard does and the differences between certain types of motherboards, we can touch on the CPU. Except not actually touch it because that'll break it. The central processing unit is like the brain of the computer. According to Digital Trends, CPUs are built by placing billions of microscopic transistors onto a single computer chip. Those transistors allow it to make the calculations it needs to run programs that are stored on your system's memory. They're effectively minute gates that switch on or off, thereby conveying the ones or zeros that translate into everything you do with the device, be it watching videos or writing an email. But you may be asking yourself, how do CPUs get better? Better. And wouldn't all CPUs be the same if it were as simple as just throwing a bunch of transistors on a computer chip? Well, this is where Moore's Law comes into play. Gordon Moore theorized that these transistors will continuously get smaller and smaller, thus the number of said transistors on a computer chip should double about every two years. That's why your iPhone 11 absolutely stomps your grandmother's iPhone 3. Now, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but does a fairly good job of explaining how CPUs generally get better over time. Now, how does a CPU do what it does? Well, there are three general parts of the CPU's job. According to John Martindale, a CPU fetches the instruction from RAM, decodes what the instruction actually is, and then executes the instruction using relevant parts of the CPU. In this way, the CPU is the brain of the computer, it determines what needs to be done, how to do it, and then does it. Going back to our city analogy, the CPU is sort of like the mayor. The mayor operates within the town hall and generally decides what needs to be done, how to do it, and then the final execution of the job. As before, there are two major players in the CPU manufacturing market, Intel and AMD. There is tons of publicly available data comparing different CPUs from both manufacturers on different benchmarks. But the main thing that often distinguishes between one CPU and another is the core count and the thread count. A core is a physical piece of hardware on the CPU and a thread is just a software component that controls jobs. Cores increase the amount of work accomplished at a time, whereas threads improve throughput computational speed up. Now this can become technical and boring if you're not interested, but you can read more about cores and multi-threading at the useful resource I used in the description below. I opted for the AMD Ryzen 5 third generation 3600 CPU that houses six cores and 12 threads and operates at 3.6 gigahertz. If you're wondering what 3.6 gigahertz refers to, it's the clock speed of the CPU, or basically how many cycles a CPU executes per second. Now, I was also confused on what exactly a cycle is, but according to Intel, it is basically a unit of measurement that helps quantify the speed of a CPU. Another helpful explanation from Intel, sometimes multiple instructions are completed in a single clock cycle. In other cases, one instruction might be handled over multiple clock cycles. Since different CPU designs handle instructions differently, it's best to compare clock speeds within the same CPU brand and generation. Now we can see our computer city starting to take shape. We have the case acting as the city's borders, the motherboard as the town hall, and the CPU as the mayor. The next thing you'll want to look into is the random access memory, also known as RAM. And no, you can't download more for free. Now for RAM, I've sort of run out of city analogies for this other than RAM is like the super helpful assistant to the mayor that reminds the mayor of certain things to do, but if the city ever loses power, they immediately forget everything. RAM is essentially temporary memory for your computer for temporary things like browser data. RAM is important because you don't want to save everything permanently on something slow like a hard drive. As mentioned before, the CPU reads instructions from RAM, so why have the CPU tried to look through the slow turning disk of the hard drive for something you're only working on now when it can be accessed much faster through the RAM. The most common type of RAM sold today is DDR4. The older systems may use DDR3 or even DDR2. The numbers simply denote the generation of RAM. In my build, I used 16 gigabytes of DDR Corsair Vengeance RAM operating at 3200 megahertz 
And again, the megahertz portion is just the speed of the RAM. And also look at these colors. I got the RGB ones, beautiful. For most people, eight gigabytes to 16 gigabytes of RAM is the perfect amount for good performance and a reasonable price. Now with all this communication and execution of tasks, the mayor can get pretty sweaty. This is where the CPU cooler and heatsink comes in. To operate a computer for more than 30 seconds, the CPU needs some sort of heat dispersion and cooling. Otherwise your CPU will begin to throttle and most modern processors have built-in mechanisms that will force the system to power down if the CPU is getting too hot. Two common forms of CPU cooling is fan coolers that use a heat sink attached to the CPU with thermal compound. This works to disperse heat through a system of metalwork as well as cool the heat sink with a fan. Another way is to use an AIO, which is an all-in-one liquid cooler. The theory is that as opposed to metal pipes of a fan heat sink, water will dissipate heat more effectively. Now the thermal tests aren't crazy different, but the aesthetics sure are, and we all all know that 90% of PC performance is aesthetics. I purchased the Corsair Platinum H100i liquid CPU cooler that features a 240 millimeter radiator that gets mounted to the case and two intake fans that cool the surrounding parts. Also, it has all of the RGB. Additionally, there is a simple pump mechanism that pumps water around the CPU and then cools it using the radiator and accompanying fans. I guess you can consider the CPU cooler as the air conditioning system in the mayor's office that ensures they can think properly and don't get too frustrated with the armpit stains. Since we aren't all sweaty, we can move to the graphics card. Essentially, there are two forms of graphics processing, either integrated graphics that can be built into some CPUs and motherboards and discrete graphics cards that are slotted into the motherboard. Similar to how the CPU is the brain of the computer, the GPU or graphics processing unit is thus the big noggin of the graphics card. The GPU works as a translator. It takes data coming from the CPU and transforms it into imagery. More complex visuals like you find in high definition games require more complex and quicker GPUs to accommodate the stream of data. In our city, the graphics card is sort of like the local construction company that takes the mayor's designs and sort of builds them up. Graphics cards can be the most expensive part of any PC build and sometimes the largest. I went with the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2060, which features up to six times faster performance ray tracing in video games, and AI-enhanced graphics. If you are interested in reading further about all the technical specifics of GPUs and why they are often the choice over CPUs for intense computation in finance and machine learning, you can find links in the description below. Now, how will the city and all its parts function without electricity? Getting a reliable power supply from a reputable brand is vitally important because you don't want some cheap product to fry all of your newly bought parts. When looking into power supplies, you'll likely come across non-modular, semi-modular, and fully modular units. This just refers to what wires come directly out of the power supply unit. Non-modular means you'll have all of these power connectors coming out of the power supply unit, and you may or may not use all of them. This could ultimately lead to a nightmare with cable management. Semi-modular means that some of the essential power connectors like the motherboard and CPU connectors will be baked into the unit itself and then you have the option of adding more. Fully modular means you choose every power connector and where it gets plugged in on the unit. I generally recommend fully modular power supplies as they make cable management cleaner and much easier to handle. It is generally recommended to look for power supplies with the 80 plus gold or higher rating and make sure the output of the power supply will meet the power consumption consumption of all your other parts. I suggest using PCPartPicker.com that allows you to put together theoretical builds, check compatibility, and estimated energy consumption. I went with the fully modular 80 plus gold EVGA Supernova G3 750 watt power supply that features a silent mode such that the power supply fan will not spin until reaching a certain temperature which is perfect for my smaller build. One of the last things to consider is a permanent storage drive. Generally, there are two storage drives most people use. Solid state drives, commonly abbreviated as SSD, are typically more expensive for the same quantity of storage, but much faster. Solid state drives operate all digitally, hence their faster read and write speeds, and with the onset of M.2 drives attached directly to your motherboard, are drastically smaller in physical size. Hard drives comparatively allow for more storage at a cheap cheaper price but physically write on a disk so you'll end up hearing more noise from your machine because of the physical read and write actions. Therefore, I recommend getting both an SSD and a hard drive. I personally install my operating system in games I play a lot on my SSD, whereas games that require a lot more space and most of my video content I store on a hard drive. In my current system, I have a 500 gigabyte Western Digital M.2 SSD with Windows 10. I have a one terabyte Western Digital hard drive 
and I also have a 120 gigabyte Samsung SSD from an older machine just for some extra storage. Some last things to consider, temperature is always a factor in computer performance, therefore having a sufficient number of reliable fans and a proper airflow setup in your build is essential for consistent high performance. Additionally, as optical drives or disk trays become increasingly foreign, with many cases not even supporting optical drive bays, installing an operating system via USB thumb drive is the way to go. Factoring in the price of an operating system is also important when budgeting for your final build. Having access to ethernet ports near where your PC will be operating is ideal. Alternatively, some motherboards have built-in Wi-Fi capabilities, but note that not all motherboards do. So in the case that the motherboard you purchased does not have onboard Wi-Fi, you will typically need to purchase a Wi-Fi expansion card that can be easily slotted into your motherboard. I hope you guys liked the video and found it entertaining and informational at the same time. Again, consider checking out Linus Tech Tips and Bitwit for all the computer bills your heart could possibly desire. My name is Michael. I make college advice, computer science, and tech videos. So consider hitting that subscribe button if you are interested in any of those topics. Consider checking out one of my past videos. And also you saw less of my face in this video because my regular camera is currently being repaired. So I'm just relying on this webcam here. Comment down below if you are thinking about building a computer and what parts you are planning on using. Comment down below any questions for me or suggestions for future videos. Tune in next time for when I eat an entire box of espresso beans. Bye-bye.